Howdy folks. Well, I have to admit that in my haste in trying to get companion planting part three video and the article on my blog uploaded and done and move on, I neglected to talk about three herbs that I like to use in the garden and plus some key points that I wanted to, additional points that I thought would be important to make. So That's hysterical. Hey, hang on a second. You mean to tell me that you, Miss Type A Personality, OCD, retired school teacher, actually made a mistake in her organizational outline? Maybe that's because Lucy Brain was in my head. Okay, I'm back. Moving on. Rolled it. First up, borage. Borage is one of my favorites. It is an annual, but it will self-seed if you leave it in place. You want to plant it in its own container. It's going to get two to three feet tall with several branching stems, um, usually about 12, 14 inches wide or more at the top, and it flowers a beautiful purpley flower. It does not like wet feet, so again, it doesn't need to sit in water. Now, what are the benefits of borage? Number one, it repels many garden pests, along with the tomato hornworms and cabbage worms. Number two, it improves the flavor and growth of companion plants if interplanted with them. Now, we'll pause right here and say again, it needs to be in its own container when you're doing container gardening. If you were doing in-ground, um, regular garden beds or raised bed, then I would consider interplanting borage. Number three, it attracts beneficial insects, especially bees and parasitic wasps. Number four, borage leaves are known to contain potassium, calcium, and vitamin C. The older, larger fading leaves make nice mulch for almost any vegetable. Number five, the borage plant material is also a rich contributor of nutrients and bulk for a compost bin. And number six, fermenting the leaves in water for about two weeks, then straining the solids makes an excellent organic fertilizer. This borage solution can be kept for several months and you dilute it uh, one part of your borage fertilizer to 10 parts water. The companion plants for borage are the tomato, strawberries, cabbage, and squash. I have found no foes in my research for borage. The second herb is hyssop. It is a perennial. Interestingly, it's a member of the mint family, but unlike most mints, it's a well-behaved plant. And it's perfect for containers if you let them just grow and clump in a container. Now, hyssop also prefers to dry out completely. Unlike other mints, it does not like wet feet. So you let the soil completely dry before giving it a very thorough drink. The benefits of hyssop Number one, it attracts bees, butterflies, and hummingbirds. Two, it repels cabbage moths and cabbage butterflies. And three, it is said to stimulate the growth of grapes. Companion plants for hyssop, plant near cabbage, and all of the coal crops. Again, I have found no foes in my research for hyssop. And the third herb is yarrow. It is a perennial. Now it too likes dry conditions, so it is perfect for container growing. It also can become very invasive, so again, it's pretty perfect for container growing. The benefits of yarrow are many. Number one, yarrow attracts beneficial insects and pollinators 
look at the list, such as lace wings, parasitic wasps, ground beetles, spiders, ladybugs, and hoverflies. These insects find habitat for egg laying or overwintering refuge in the fern-like foliage. Number two, Yarrow is well known for its ability in improving the soil when left to grow a season before removing. And number three, it is a very valuable compost activator as it increases the nutrient value of any compost heap. You just chop up the stalks and the leaves and add them to your compost pot. Companion plants for yarrow are the brassicas, tomatoes, melons, beans, and spinach. And again, I have found no foes for yarrow. I will say though that it is considered pretty invasive, so you have to keep it cut back. To continue with the points on um, companion planting with herbs, um, number five, I had given you four before, number five would be to really study each herb plant that you are putting into your garden know how to prepare it for the winter most all of the herbs if left in place will drop their seeds and can become invasive growing where you don't intend for them to grow keeping them pruned is really key number six when interplanting herbs with other herbs or flowers in the same container. You need to consider uh, first the size and the growth patterns of each herb. Uh, secondly, don't intermix herbs that where some of them like to have very wet and moist soil with ones that like to be dry. And third, make sure you're not planting foes to each other. I have a few more points that you can read in the blog article, but the main, uh, the other main one that I wanted to cover in the video is giving you some suggestions on what to do with your perennial herbs, maybe when you're tired of them or they've outgrown their containers. So let's go over a few of those possibilities. As I've said before, keeping them pruned is key. But even doing that, there are some after about three to five years that just need replacing. Rosemary being one, for example. A lot of these herbs, the recommendation in the maintenance area is to divide them, uh, usually in the spring. But if you'll just check the maintenance section on each of the herbs in the article, it'll, it'll give you su suggestions there. But you could always pot them up in a larger container. You could always actually kind of create a, a whole herb garden, either in a raised bed or in um, a really huge container. In fact, I have right here, this is a grow bag that Larry sent me last year. He wanted me to do a video with it, and it is 150 gallons. I mean... The thing is enormous, really and truly enormous. I don't know if you can see how big in the camera, but it's, it's like four feet long and four feet wide. So I think a 150 gallon grow bag might make a pretty good herb garden for a ton of herbs and flowers. And the third most exciting one I wanted to really point, I wanted to make, um, was if you grow fruit trees, you could consider transplanting some of these herbs underneath your fruit trees. I don't know if you've ever heard of something called a fruit tree guild, but the concept of a fruit tree guild is you have your central element being your fruit tree or a nut tree, but we're talking about fruit trees right now, and you underplant it with a variety of things that might normally be found naturally planted together, and they all offer benefits to the fruit tree. 
For example, under plantings in a fruit tree guild might be plants that you would see that fertilize or repel pests, attract beneficial insects, create mulch, and suppress grass. The general idea here is to take advantage of the plants to reduce your cost, your labor, and importing materials in to try to get your fruit tree to grow and thrive. If you want to learn a little bit more about fruit tree guilds, I recommend this book, Gaia's Garden. Um, I have it marked here. And this is the picture of a diagram of a fruit tree guild. This happens to be an apple tree guild. And I'm going to go over it real quickly with you. So here is the basic concept. You see first the center element would be the apple tree. Fruit tree roots in general are very shallow. One of the things that you'll always hear when planting a fruit tree is to try to keep it weeded keep grass away from it because grass and weeds are its competition. So in the fruit tree guild, the first thing you want to do is plant something that is like a barrier, a grass suppressor. So in this case, the suggestions are to use grass suppressing bulbs. You can see here that planting dozens of daffodils, commas, perennial alliums like garlic, garlic chives, etc at both the drip line of the fruit tree when it's at its maturity diameter and another ring about 18 inches around the trunk. That is going to suppress a grass invasion. We actually have six fruit tree guilds on our property. Uh, here is a picture of a peach tree when we very first planted it. You can see the ring of daffodils around the outside, and you can see a little section uh, closer in to the trunk. Now this peach tree guild is only 10 foot in diameter because it is a dwarf peach tree, and that will be its size of the drip line at maturity. We need to do a lot more planting of daffodils. Each year I try to add to those, but I think this year uh, I'm also going to add a lot of garlic chives because they just grow profusely and that will really help to fill in to keep that grass from coming into the circle. Moving in from there, the second thing you add are mulch plants. You can see here in the diagram a broken circle of just a few mulch plants. Some examples would be comfrey, artichoke, ferns rhubarb, nasturtiums, dwarf yarrow, wild strawberry, and reeds. Now this next one is where I'm really thinking about transplanting those herbs that you either don't want in the garden anymore or they're a little bit large or they need dividing. This would be where you might do it and that's in number three, the nutrient accumulators. So take a look here. Dotted around these mulch plants that we just talked about are four or five nutrient accumulators. Some good nutrient accumulators listed are yarrow, dill, chamomile, dandelion, bee balm, Queen Anne's lace, mints, chicory, plantain, and lamb's quarters. Many of these herbs are edible and many of them that were in that list are ones that I've already shown you in companion planting, uh, the original herb video and this addendum. After you plant the nutrient accumulators, then you plant a few pest repellents. Another half dozen or so are added to deter the pests and attract the beneficial insects. Some good ones are nasturtiums which also those are in the list that serve as a mulch plant. False indigo, elderberry, wild marigold, Mexican marigold, and even horseradish. And the last thing in the guild, it's not really shown in the diagram, but it is talked about in the book, is adding some thick ground cover nitrogen fixers. Some good ground cover to fill in the rest of the area 
are Dutch or New Zealand white clover, alfalfa, lupine, or cowpeas. Now some of these plants that are underneath this fruit tree gill can get uh, pretty large. So what is recommended is that four or five times throughout the summer you do a slash and drop, right, and leaving it in place for it to compost. Thanks for watching folks. I hope you'll come back for companion planting part four with flowers. I'll do my best not to leave anything out. And remember, bye and have a good you again. Oh, whatever. They what? like me better. Mr. Farmer Brown likes me better. He does not. He does Yeah, not. I make him laugh. Hey, you don't. I cook food. I cook food. Yeah. I cook food. Fire. Three times. Three times. Three times. And you put it yes, out. Yes, I put it out. You caught them on fire. You caught the pans on fire three times in the kitchen. la dee da la dee da You are so wrong. I'm organized, but I'm fun.